two, one. Welcome in, Husker Extra Podcast. Sipple has rubbed his eyes. He's ready to go. Parker's here too. I'm Chris. It is a little early for us today, 12, 12 p.m. on a Friday. March bright and early. 5th. Bright and early. We'll have an early afternoon podcast for you guys. So you're welcome for that little treat before you head home for work from the weekend. You're from welcome. Weekend. <laughs> I feel like we should say you're welcome on here, Mark. For, the, for what we're giving them. That's, that's a little presumptuous, but I feel like people are a little ungrateful for what we're giving them. <laughs> yeah, gratitude's important. Not, our, like guy, Lauren, gratitude. not our guy Lauren, who probably deserves a shout out. Lauren listens every week and he sends us really nice emails. It's like, God bless you, Lauren. Yeah. You're the yeah. man. You are the yeah. man. We need more like you. All right. Well, should, let's just get right into it, huh? We're going to talk some football, some hoops. Uh, baseball starts today in a little less than three hours. We'll get to that, too. But we're going to we're gonna start with some crouton. Uh, business is starting to pick up a little bit over at uh, North Stadium. Uh, Huskers put out an offer to a 2022 quarterback uh, yesterday, uh, in addition to some other, some other offers starting to go out. And, and I'll turn it over to, to the resident recruiting guy, uh, Parker, and, and let him kind of explain it all to us. Oh, that's sort of Parker. That's not me. That's not. I'm not the res- resident recruiting guy. You're the recruiting expert emeritus. Yeah, <laughs> you've got like you're like the you're like the really old guy that comes back and gets like the honorary doctorate from the university. some ageism right Is that off ageism? the bat. Yeah, that was ageism. <laughs> emeritus right, conveys some some level of expertise and wisdom, though. So yeah, a level of respect. I would say. level of respect. You spun out of that very well. HR will not need to be contacted. <laughs> Stand down. Stand down. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, on the one hand, it's it's sort of slow going. Um, like if you look at the big picture, just in the sense of Nebraska doesn't have a, a commitment yet for the 2022 class. Um, and there's the dead periods in, in effect through May. Um, it's shaping up. I mean, the summer is going to be really interesting. And I don't know. I don't know that like in the next week or anything, we might, but I don't know that we're going to learn anything definitive about the summer, like in the very short term. But I do think that, that there's a growing sense that something has to happen, obviously, because, you know, on May 31st, it'll be 14 months since any of these kids have been able to visit anywhere. And, you know, for guys that haven't even played their senior year of high school yet, that's a really large chunk of their, their high school career. And we, we've sort of talked about that, but one of the things that's interesting is I wrote a couple of days ago about quarterback recruiting and about sort of, there's been a little bit of a mini run of, of quarterbacks coming off the board in recent weeks. Uh, it actually continued this morning or last night. Um, so Ty Simpson, who is a kid Nebraska really liked in, in Tennessee um, blew up, became a five-star uh, quarterback committed to Alabama. So when that happened, then Clemson, which also wanted Ty Simpson, offered Cade Klubnik, who's a quarterback in Texas. He committed very quickly to Clemson. Uh, and then yes, it was either this morning or yesterday, Steve Angeli, who's a guy who uh, Nebraska had offered on the East Coast at Bergen Catholic, which is Ramir Johnson's high school, um, committed to Notre Dame. So there's been this sort of like run of quarterbacks coming off the board that have Nebraska offers. There's still a bunch uh, that are out there um, that are still available for the taking that we know Nebraska is recruiting, but they added an interesting guy to the mix um, just a couple of days ago in Richard Torres from San Antonio, Texas. And I think most of the time, like generally speaking, I would think of Texas high school recruiting and think like there's no such thing as under the radar guy in Texas. You know, it's one of the most highly recruited States and all of that, but San Antonio isn't really recruited, I think, to the same extent that, you know, Dallas and, and Houston uh, are and some of the outlying areas that are their hotbeds in, in West Texas. But interestingly, Richard Torres, the, Nebraska became his first um, power five offer. Uh, he's got an offer from UTSA right, you know, in town there. Um, but he's a guy who's starting to draw a lot of attention because uh, well, he's got a huge arm um, and he played really well in limited time. I think he played in seven games. They had a shortened season because of COVID stuff, uh, but he's six, six and 210 pounds. And he's not probably quite the runner that Adrian Martinez or Luke McCaffrey, Logan Smothers, these guys that are, you know, sub 11 and hundred type type runners, but um, he can move and um, 
he's a big kid with really interesting film. I mean, I was watching his, he's got a 10 minute highlight video on YouTube. So I was watching it just like anybody else the other day. And (laughs) there's like, he's got about four 65 yard balls that are put right on people and just dropped. I mean, like it's sort of remarkable. Like I've never seen, and, and he's got like, he's, he's running for his life on half the plays that, um, that are on his highlight film. And so it's interesting. It's like, sometimes it seems like he almost waits until the rush gets there and then goes out and whatever. And so Got anyways, it. it's very, it's very unique evaluation, but clearly Nebraska likes him and he's sort of the rare, like actual guy in Texas who went from having virtually no recruiting profile to now having one FBS offer. We'll see there may be more coming. Um, but he's certainly sort of an interesting addition to uh, Nebraska's quarterback recruiting for the 2022 class. Uh, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, the 65 year old, 65 year old. Sorry, I was looking at Steve when I said that. I don't wow. know. Wow. <laughs> wow. The 65 yard throws. And it just reminds me of our, when we were all in the office together throwing dimes to each other. Oh, yeah. Football. Yeah. Just, just running yeah, for that's... our lives. Simple that's running gonna, for his life as I rushed him off the edge. Yeah, that'll happen again soon. What yeah, I, what no. Parker said that was interesting to me is if that kid's six six two ten and he did run like McCaffrey, I don't think I think he'd be looking at Alabama or maybe the Pittsburgh Steelers or something. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's interesting. Sure, though, yeah, because the first high school the NFL player. <laughs> it, 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 he fought, he's built a yeah, he's built a little bit like Heinrich Harburg, you know, just in the sense of. He's a big, you know, he's a big kid with a big arm who probably there's some, there's obviously some refinement that's needed. Um, but he's playing seven on seven right now. Apparently, you know, he's, he's impressing there too. Um, and so he's a guy who, you know, we've seen every year there are guys and, you know, even like this last recruiting class, there was a kid in Utah um, who went from being sort of unheralded to being a top 50 recruit. Um, his name was Jackson Dart, I think. And he just, he completely blew up and he went from being a guy who, you know, FCS type, uh, to going to USC, uh, ah. along with another quarterback, but they just felt like he was so good that they couldn't afford not to take him. So it's not unheard of that guys come from sort of off the radar, um, between their junior and senior year and really blow up. It's probably, you know, more, it's still not common, but it's probably more common now given how much the pandemic has limited the ability to go out and, you know, actually see people in person and all of that. So I don't know. I, I don't know if Richard Torres is the best bet for Nebraska in 2022. There's six or seven other guys that they have offers out to that aren't committed at this point, but um, they obviously like them. And, and, and Mario Verduzco has said ever since he's been here that as soon as they offer a quarterback, the offer is committable. So if a- anybody who they offer as a quarterback, that person can, um, you know, if the offer comes from, from Mario or from Frost, typically it comes from Frost in person, um, that, that means, hey, you can, you can commit whenever you want. And so um, just a new name to watch in that mix. And it'll be interesting to see if, if Richard Torres, you know, jumps at an opportunity like that or if he waits to see if maybe, you know, not even like, not even like oh, I'm going to parlay this Nebraska offer into something that might be better, but kids like the respect that comes with scholarship offers. And so maybe he'll wait and see, you know, if other schools come calling in his recruitment too. Uh, for the novices in the crowd, typically I, well, you, you mentioned it in your piece that quarterbacks typically commit early in the process. Why is that? Well, I think a lot of times from the, the quarterbacks, um, they, they tend to get offers earlier. Um, there's a lot of good athletes that get offers early at this point, but Um, that that's part of it. And then the other part of it is that coaching staffs like to build their recruiting classes around quarterbacks. A lot of the times quarterbacks, typically not always, but typically you're talking about leadership position guy. That's going to be a good peer recruiter and a guy who has a coaching staff, you can point to and say, Hey, you, you, you want to come play with this guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then frankly, the other aspect of that is numbers, right? Like you're typically occasionally you might take two quarterbacks in a class, but for the most part, you're going to take one per class. And so you get into this sort of, um, you know, strategic situation where if there's an offer that you like, you might not want to sit around for two more months and wait, because what if that school takes someone else? And so that's sort of like, there's a number of factors, 
you know, wanting to secure your spot and be the only quarterback in a class and then schools want to build classes around quarterbacks. So that all sort of feeds into it. You saw that, I mean, at the absolute upper crust of college football recruiting, you saw that with the situation with Ty Simpson and Kate Klubnik. I mean, both Clemson and Alabama were recruiting Ty Simpson. And when he went to Alabama, Clemson immediately offered the next guy on their board, Kate Klubnik. They have the luxury of doing that where they can just, you know, target one at a time and say, until this guy goes somewhere else, he's our guy. And if he goes somewhere else, then we'll just take whoever we want next, basically. That's not how it works for most schools in the country. So with Nebraska, you know, they, they typically, they've recruited quarterbacks um, from 2019, now 19, 20, 21, 22 class, basically the same way. They'll offer, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 guys that they all think can do the job. And then they'll sort of let, the player's interests naturally develop or, you know, not develop from there. So it's, um, they're still, you know, last year, I think they got the quarterback. Um, they offered Harburg in like May and he recruited in, or he committed in, in, in May. Um, so it, we're sort of in the normal window here, I think pandemic wise for, for quarterback recruiting for Nebraska. All right. Um, no, I mean, they, they have not gotten a commitment yet. Um, for this, for the class of 2022, I guess it's just almost obligatory to ask the question, is that okay? What's wrong with the program? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's it's wrong? It's just obligatory. It's okay, but I, it's getting toward a point where it's not going to be totally fine for like a whole lot longer. You know, I think they were hoping that, I mean, everyone was hoping that the dead period would end sooner than it has. And so, Nebraska, and they're right about this, you know, there, there's no doubt about it. They're best off when they can get kids on campus, right? See uh, Lincoln, see Memorial Stadium. Ideally, you want to see a crowd at Memorial Stadium. That just, they haven't been able to do that because of the, the pandemic. And so I think a couple things you'll see, I mean, there, there's definitely a, a lot of guys, particularly in the Midwest, that they're in pretty good position for. And so I think what you'll see now is if those kids want to wait until the summer, to make their decision because they want to take visits. I think Nebraska is fine with that, right? Okay. Yeah. Come see Lincoln in June, you know, come to a, on an official visit or whatever. But I think there are some guys like take the guys that are in, you know, Kansas or Iowa, um, Colorado, wherever anywhere in the region at this point, if those guys were going to, if, if um, Oh, I don't know. Who's a good example. Um, if the kids in like Jaron Canick, for example, he's in Hayes, Kansas, five, four or five hours away. If he was like, I want to commit in April, I think there would be some conversation about whether, you know, are you going to come to Lincoln on your own and see, you know, just walk around that sort of thing. I think you'll see them push harder for guys now if they want to make a decision before the dead period ends, basically, because they don't have a choice at this point. Like you, it's going far enough in the dead period has gone far enough into the cycle that if players want to commit um, before taking visits, um, maybe before Nebraska is like, OK, we have a lot of players we like that we think are going to wait. But the more players who decide to do it early, the more Nebraska has to be in contention for those guys. This okay. So it's just sort of a, it's really fluid. I think you'll see a rush of visits this summer, um, assuming the NCAA figures that out a, a way to allow that, which is no guarantee. Um, but I think you'll see the numbers jump, um, you know, if not before May 31st and after, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're start, starting to walk a fine line. I mean, Ohio state's got 11 guys in their class already. I think Michigan's got six or seven, eight, maybe. Um, so schools are definitely classes are growing and Nebraska is fine taking the approach they're taking, but they can't get left too far behind basically. Okay. Interesting, Parker. So then people always wonder what's going on over at the stadium now. They're in just the middle. They're essentially in the middle of winter condition or maybe in the trending toward the late Second stages half, yeah. of winter. Yeah, trending toward the late stages of winter conditioning, getting ready for the start of spring ball, which is, a, a, I believe it's a March 30th start. Yes. So they've got um, two more. I think they've got two more weeks, two more full weeks of winter conditioning. OK, um, so it's the late stages. Yeah. Yeah. And then they've got a week off the week of March 22nd. 
that, I think they're all off that week. Then they start spring ball the next week. So, uh, yeah, they're coming down, coming down to it. Really, I mean, they're six weeks in. It's kind of crazy. Six six weeks in or so, five weeks into to winter conditioning, a couple weeks left, and then uh, yeah, gearing up for spring ball, which starts in just over three weeks. There you go, Baz. Uh, Nebraska. Steve. Baz. Baz. Basketball. <laughs> Basketball. <laughs> Nebraska thumped last night in Iowa City. Uh, what was it? 102 to 64. Does that sound 102 right? 64? Yep. A 38 point loss. The worst loss of Fred Hoiberg's career as a college coach and would be, I think he had four. I went back and looked last night because I, I enjoy inflicting self-harm. I went back and looked through all of his NBA games and it would be, he had four NBA games that were a larger margin than that. And three of them were 39 points. So um, one of the worst losses of Fred Hoiberg's coaching career, Nebraska was never in it um, down double digits. I think four or five minutes into the game, cut it back to nine and then got outscored 16 to three over the last six minutes of the half. I kind of had an inkling that it might be ugly. I thought Nebraska, or I thought Iowa might win that game big. Um, Iowa's playing really good basketball right now. They're playing as well as just about anybody in the conference, um, anybody in the country. And it's a bad matchup for Nebraska with Luca Garza uh, inside and the shooters that Iowa has. You thought maybe after the way they played against Rutgers that that maybe Nebraska could make it a game, but I think Iowa's just so much better offensively than Rutgers is that it was going to be tough. And, you know, then Jordan Bohannon gets hot, uh, hits eight threes. Nebraska, I thought, looked a step slow from the beginning. Uh, looked sluggish most of the night. was very sloppy, 20 turnovers. And, and Fred talked about that after the game. He said I had to get all the guys in the shoot around because I didn't feel like they had the right mentality. So who knows where that came from? You, you would hope they weren't feeling too high on themselves after winning two in a row because that got you all the way to three conference wins on the year. Mm -hmm. But – you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily erase everything that happened, all the good that happened in the Rutgers game. But man, when you go out and play probably your best game of the year and then turn around and play your worst game of the year, a few days later, that's, that's probably, that's an issue. And, and that's something that they're going to have to figure out uh, before they take on Northwestern here on Sunday. I have a hot take alert. I, we <laughs> should have, <laughs> yeah, we should have something that, that precedes a hot take like this one. Let's hear. Hey, you said that Iowa plays better offense than Rutgers. That is not a hot take. That's very obvious. What if I told you that right now Iowa's playing better defense than Rutgers? Not a hot take, Sip. Not not for people in the know, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because <laughs> that, um, hey, Bass. First of all, that is a hot take. But go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's not. And here's why. Yes, um, it's hot. It's hot. It's flaming it's hot. hot. All right, it's, it's hot. hotter than it's, hot. it's hotter than Jordan hot. Bohannon. You shut up. It's hot. Shooting the ball. Hot. All right, go ahead. Sorry. 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 Uh, a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, uh, if you look at Ken Palm's metrics, uh, Iowa was 108th in the country in adjusted defensive efficiency, which basically is a statistic that says how many points a team allows per 100 possessions, um, points per possession, basically. Um, they were 108th. Uh, after last night's game, they were 56. They moved up 52 spots in a month. Um, they've given up more than 68 points once in their last eight games, seven, eight games, and that was to Michigan. And, and no shame in doing that with the way Michigan's playing. They're playing really good. They're, I mean, they are. Eh? And it's easy for the people on this side of the river to, to make fun of Iowa and make fun of Fran McCaffrey's teams for, for always having the February collapse. And a lot of it's warranted a lot of the times, but that's not been the case this year. They figured something out on the defensive end and it's not like they need to be great defensively. They just need to be competent. They just need to be good enough with that offense. And they've been good enough, especially, and they've been really good these last two, three weeks. Yeah. You know, um, it, that offense is so good. They don't need to be a top 10 defense or a top 20 defense. But if they're a top 50 defense, a top 60 defense, you're going to see stuff like what happens last night if the team isn't ready to play and they're, and they're humming on offense. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hot take in the sense that Iowa traditionally doesn't play good defense, but they've played really good defense the last two or three weeks. And I think last night was 
yes, Nebraska played very poorly, and there's no question about that. But I think a lot of that too has to do with Iowa and how well they're playing on that side. Of the, on that side, yeah, they're, they're they're played. I never thought I'd say this sentence. Iowa was playing suffocating man to man defense. Yeah, I, I was playing man to man defense right now. Yeah. Then it's been a team that plays a lot of zone under frame right. because they have to try and cover things up because their man has not been good. But I mean, just look, look at the results. I mean, Nebraska had 20 turnovers and yes, they, Nebraska turns it over a lot, right? But they don't turn it over 20 times, you know, they no. might turn it over 15 times, 16 times. They don't turn it over 20. And, and the thing with Iowa is if you turn it over, it's a buck on the other end almost every yeah. time. It's not, it's not like a lot of teams where you turn it over and a team might get into its half-court offense. Like, I was getting it, and they're going. And they're looking to put somebody on a poster or they're looking to kick it out for a three or they're looking for Bo Hannon to just pull up from 25 feet and fire it. And they went in last night. And when it gets going like that, I was as, as good as anybody. And, and like I said, people who root for the team in red don't want to hear that, but I was good. And if they play a defense like that, they're going to, they're going to be a tough out in the big 10 tournament. They're going to be really tough out in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. The depth that Fran McCaffrey has the depth of talent on that roster is makes me, I mean, I, it occurred to me last night that watching that game, I wonder if Nebraska will ever have that sort of depth of talent on its roster. I, it, they brought in, you know, they lost that Jack Nungy and that was a loss for them. He was a, he was a, he was a critical player off the bench, a six foot 11 kid, but now they're using number 15 bass. Help me out. Keegan. Uh, yeah. The freshman Murray. Keegan Johnson, Murray. Keegan Murray. Keegan Murray. Yeah. Keegan yeah. Johnson's Keegan a freshman at Iowa next year. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Keegan Murray yeah. is maybe better than Nungy. Uh, then, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Then, then what I the other thing that was striking to me is we we don't have to go through their starting lineup. You saw what Bohannon did, and you know how good Weiss Camp is. People know that. The, I thought the guys that he was bringing in late looked really good. Yes, yeah. yes. that looks like a good second five to me. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of talent there. And again, Iowa played really well, and Nebraska played really bad, and it didn't really matter who Nebraska was putting on the court last night. It, you. It, they could have run us three out there against them. We could have found a way to score against the, them the way they were playing. Um, but you're right, Sip. That's and that just again speaks to the the depth of talent in the Big Ten. I was probably going to finish third or fourth in the Big Ten with that roster and that team. You know, and then that's a that's a really good team. Isn't so, it interesting that we talked about how good the Big Ten was going in, and it's lived up to it, and maybe a little more. Yeah, I think it's exceeded it. I, I think we all expect it to be to be really good. And it's been, not, nobody expected Michigan to do what they're doing this year. Um, you know, nobody really expected Ohio state to be as good as they've been this year, a potential one seed. We knew Illinois would be pretty good, but did we think Illinois would be a one seed in the NCAA tournament? Probably not. You know, maybe, I don't know. Iowa's probably going to be a two seed or a three seed in the NCAA tournament. You know, it's, and, and that's just the top four teams. That's not talking about the teams like the Wisconsin's that's going to, that are going to be in you know, seven, eight. Or watch Purdue. Purdue. Uh, yeah. Per- yeah, Purdue's, Purdue's tougher playing now. well. Purdue's one of the youngest teams in the country. Their their uh, Ken Palm, their experience ranking is three hundred and twenty eighth in the. They country. play four. They play four freshmen a lot. That kid, yeah. that kid, um, the, the kid that Jay Knight, Jay Knight, Jay Knight. Yeah. yeah, his mom's the uh, women's coach at Notre Dame, and like I was <laughs> when we when they were playing, um, who they played the other night. It, I think maybe I was watching them play Wisconsin, and I was thinking like. If you could, if you were starting a program with a freshman in the league, like how many are you taking, or a freshman or a sophomore? Like how many players in the Big Ten are you taking before that kid? Because he's real. Not good. many. Yeah, not many. Yeah. And if you're not taking him, maybe you're taking one of his freshman teammates on that team. You know, they had that was a really good recruiting class that that they got. So, yeah, I mean, again, Purdue's probably gonna be, I don't know, seven seed, eight seed in the tournament. You, you want to be a one seed seeing that, you know, if you're Gonzaga, you want to be seeing Purdue in the second round. I don't, you know? Um, so yeah. I, Wait a like second, Bass. You put only a seven, they're only a seven seed. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a bracketologist. My name, my last name is Lunardi. So I don't I th- know. They got to be higher than that. I, think I mean, let's look, let's look, check it out, Parker. Check it out. I'm going to go check out Joe Lunardi. Yeah. Well, I, the point is, you don't want to be the team on the other side of the bracket playing them. You know, no, 
You don't. Uh, no, I, they look like a team that can win at least two in the tournament. To me. I think there's a lot of teams like that in the Big Ten. You know, Illinois could go to the Final Four. They could lose the second week, the second round. You know, I th- Iowa could do the same thing. Michigan looks like they're built for the long haul. Ohio State could make a run, could lose in the stick round. Purdue, same thing. Wisconsin, same thing. There's a lot of teams that are really going to make deep runs, or a lot of those teams are going to flame out early, and everybody's going to go, well, see, the Big Ten was overrated. Well, not necessarily. No. You know, it's all matchups and, and all that stuff. But I, I think there's just a lot of teams that have the potential to make deep runs. And, and it, that tells you, again, how good a lot of these teams are, that they have the potential to even be talking about that. Lenardi's latest bracket has two Big Ten one seeds, Michigan and Illinois. Yeah. Two two seeds, Iowa and Ohio State. And then they have – he has Purdue as a four. A yeah, four? Thought, yeah. So Wisconsin as a six. Maryland's a nine. I'm not going in order. I'm just looking at names yeah. that pop out here. Um, Rutgers, as Maryland. A, Rutgers as a ten. If, you, if you're a seven seed, do you want to be seeing Rutgers in the first round? Or if you're a two seed, do you want to be seeing Rutgers in the second round? Hell no, you don't, you know? That team's good enough to beat a couple teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's just hard. It's just hard. So, you know, now the question for Nebraska is that not that they had a lot to play for anyway. Um, losing last night locked them into the 14 seed at the Big Ten tournament next week, which they're probably going to be anyway. Uh, Barn beating Iowa and beating Northwestern. But now can you regroup in time to, to go beat Northwestern on the road? That's a team you can beat. And then you go to the Big Ten tournament and you kind of start looking at matchups there and Looks like Nebraska's probably going to play a Penn State or a Minnesota that that first game. And look, you beat both of those teams. You could beat you could beat you could beat that team. Then you start looking ahead to that second game, and maybe it's like a Wisconsin or something like that. And and Wisconsin hasn't played great, you know, the mm-hmm. last the last couple of weeks. That's a team you can beat. Yep. So can you get can you get your minds right? Can you can you flush what happened last night? And, and look ahead. And, and I think they can just because the way the schedule set up for them, just playing every other day, you kind of have to do that uh, anyway. So they've been in that mode for a while now, but you, you can see a path if you squint a little bit for them to, to win two or three games here. Absolutely. And, you know, and then you go into the offseason, I think completely different outlook if that happens. That uh, the, a potential 11 14 between Penn State and Nebraska that opened the Big Ten tournament would be sweet, especially given the way that those two games against Penn State played out. Yep. You know, yeah. like Two. last possession twice yep. and then having them play again in Indianapolis, that, especially, yeah, like you say, you, you got a six seed in Wisconsin that isn't playing very well. I mean, both those teams would, I would think, smell. Yeah, you don't think you don't think Penn State's sitting there going, oh, yeah, we could go on a run, too, with the way we play everybody close. So, yeah, and Penn State and Nebraska played a few times in the in the Big Ten tournament, two or three times, I think. They've always been close games there, um, too. So. That's a, That's an interesting matchup. Minnesota's just a, a tire fire right now. Like there, there's not a team in the country that wants the season to be over more than Minnesota right now. That Penn State had them down twenty the other night. You know, like it's and they're at, Minnesota was in the NCAA tournament two weeks ago, and, and now they they can't get out of their own way. So, yeah, it's. It, I think that's. Yeah, it's it's just brutal. Marcus Carr scored a million points, but I mean that Richard Patino, Rick Rick Patino, Richard Patino's you know turbo fire. Up in Minnesota. Yeah, Richard. It's it's Richard. Yeah, Richard. Rick little is coaching Richard. Iowa. Little Richard. Young, young Richard, not little Richard. Yeah, I shouldn't say that. Um, so yeah, uh, I think if you're Nebraska, you look at that and you go, We're we're in an okay spot, but we got to put this one behind us and, and figure out what we're gonna do. Yeah, next. they play at 1 30 on is it 1 30 on Sunday, Baz? I think it's 12 30. Oh, 1 30 Eastern. 30. Yeah, 1 30 early, Eastern time. Yeah, 1 30 Eastern. Let me look at the calendar here. <laughs> Okay, oh, yeah. know, that's a twelve thirty central. Okay, yep. you know uh, that always messes me up. So it's a twelve thirty game. They, I mean, it's critical. I'm not. I'm serious. They need to get rest today. Yeah, they if do. If I was Fred, I'd say don't just stay off your feet as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Well, see, that's what they did before the Iowa game too. It, they did that before the Iowa game too. They took that day off after the uh, after the Minnesota or after the Rutgers game. Came back walk through the next day, did a good hard walk through in Iowa. And then we saw what happened. So we'll see if they changed up. You're right. So if they need to get off their feet, knowing, knowing that this is a much more winnable game than the one they just played for sure. Tough though. Northwestern will not be easy to beat up. No, they, they play, they play teams tough. Um, they played, they beat Ohio state early in the year. Um, they started three. It's, it was a long time ago, but Northwestern started three and O 
uh, in Big Ten play. They're they're very capable. That's a that's a team that returned about everybody. Hey, last year. hey, Bass, Bass. Hey. We didn't ask. We didn't even mention Teddy Allen. I, I got a question for you. Monday morning, were you were you surprised by that announcement that Teddy Allen was leaving the program? Well, I was feeding my son a bottle when the news came out. So uh, in, in that sense, yes, I was. I'm, am I surprised that he left the program? Yeah, not necessarily. No, I don't. I think most people probably saw that playing out after one year. Am I surprised at the timing of it a little? Yeah. Um, you know, just with four games left in the regular season. And people say, well, how do you do that? And, and how does that happen? And we may never know the, the full answer. You know, I reached out to Teddy uh, a couple of times just to see if you want to talk about it. And he didn't respond, which is which is his prerogative. And that's fine. But, you know, it's it's a deal where in my mind, you know, I think I think he was pretty hurt. I think that wrist was pretty hurt. And you know what? What what are you playing for at that point? Uh, you're in a season that's going nowhere. You've got a potential pro career ahead of you. It's to me, it was almost like an opt out without actually opting out uh, in a sense. Um, get, you know, get the wrist healthy, focused on school, get it done, get graduated, get on with your life. It's, it's been a long road for Teddy and we all know that um, both before college and, and his college experience. He's, he's traveled a lot of miles and been a lot of places. So it, it may be, I think it just got to a point where he was ready to be done and, and with the way that he didn't really fit with what Fred Hoiberg wants to do offensively, schematically. I think it's pretty clear this is probably a mutual thing. I, and again, we, we may never know how it went down, but I could envision it being a deal where Teddy went to Fred and said, you know what, coach, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. And Fred said, all right, you know, that, that's fine. We wish you luck and, and, and we'll support you. And Fred said, said as much uh, after the game the other night. We'll support Parker, Teddy the way we can. Parker had a good theory, Baz, as to why. I mean, the one unanswered question – in all that is why not just sit on the bench with your teammates for the rest of the season? But Parker, what, what was your theory on that? Well, it was similar to, there was this conversation about in, in football with some of the opt-outs that you can't, the reason why teams were strict about, okay, if you're not going to play, you can't be around the team is because of COVID protocols. Like you can't, yeah. Yeah. if you're not going to be practicing every day and be playing this year, like there's not real, you can't really have someone who's not, all the way bought in to being on the floor and practicing every day, because those guys are sacrificing a lot in terms of COVID protocols and what are you doing and what are you not doing? And yeah. regardless of, obviously it's obvious at this point that most of the basketball team has had it. I mean, that, that's why we had the shutdown earlier this year, but still, I mean, you just can't, can't really have guys that are, are, are just around this year. So yeah. not really the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a good theory. Parker, and that's maybe something that's certainly not something I really thought about and maybe something not a lot of people have thought about. Um, but you're right, you know, that for what they've gone through, are you really going to risk having a guy that's not getting tested every day, that's going out, you know, that's not practicing, that's not locked down? Of course you're not. You know, you want right. to do this the right way and finish yeah. it off. So, no, I, I, it's, it is what it is. You know, it's, it's pretty clear, I think, from what we've heard publicly that, it's, that it was an amicable split. I, I know Teddy on social media has – continue to support his teammates at Nebraska uh, over the, over these last few, few weeks. It's not like he's just shut down and is not supporting those guys anymore. Uh, he's continued to do that. So, you know, it, I think we all thought when Teddy committed here and signed here that the fit was maybe a little iffy and, and Nebraska was taking a risk. And there was, there was times when it paid off. Certainly the, the game against Penn state, one of the great individual performances in Nebraska history, it showed what Teddy can do, but a lot of times it, it wasn't a great fit. Uh, and you, you wrote about this too, Seth, the ball would stick in his hands a lot uh, in an offense where you need to keep it moving and you need player movement and ball movement. Um, he, he took some risks defensively that, that Nebraska doesn't necessarily want their players taken. Um, and Ted, Teddy's going to play the way Teddy, Teddy plays. And that's not good, bad, or otherwise. It's just how it is. And the way Teddy plays, it's not a way that, that Fred Hoiberg wants his team to play. So you you do this now it's over with it's a clean break it wasn't messy as you wrote sip and it didn't become a distraction and then now both both sides can move forward and, and get yep. on with things yeah um, i thought fred, fred handled it well go ahead parker yeah where, where does this up uh, just briefly scout so scholarship wise are they are they even yeah. now for yeah they're they're at the they're now at the 13 scholarship limit for next year. And, and people, I've had a few people ask me, you know, what does this mean? You know, if Thor, Thor Bjarnarsson and Kobe Webster come back next year, well, they don't count against the limit right. next year. So uh, it, it, it doesn't really make any difference 
with those two guys. Um, so yeah, they're at the limit. They were one over. Um, there will certainly be more uh, attrition coming, you know, probably in the next two weeks or so, I would say. Um, a few days after Nebraska's done the Big Ten tournament, Fred Hoiberg will meet individually with all those guys, with each of those players and kind of kind of figure out where they want to go. And I, I, it would not surprise me to see multiple guys head out again. I don't think it'll be the exodus we saw last year um, and even and certainly not in Fred's first year. I think you'll see a lot of those core guys back, a lot of those rotation guys back. But certainly it's it's going to be a deal where you probably see, I don't know, you know, three, maybe four guys head out and, and find greener pastures. And we're not going to mention names here. We don't need to do that. But it's you, you can see who plays in the games and who doesn't kind of figure, figure it well, out. Let's um, just, yeah, let's just do one thing. The core guys are Lat, Mayan, Derek Walker. Um, who else would you say? Delano Banton, Trey McGowan's, um, Shamil Stevenson, maybe uh, in that okay. group. Um, okay. Derek Walker, did we say him? Derek Walker. Yeah, we said Derek. Um, yeah. Oh, the big, Ed, the other big man, Eduardo. Eduardo Andre uh, seems like a guy that should be back. And, and look, you bring those guys back, and you add that recruiting class to it next year, top twenty-five nationally. They, you got something cooking there, and, and you add a couple of transfers through the portal. They they maybe go find a point guard in the portal. Uh, maybe a you know a, a wing that can shoot it uh, at a high level, can score it at a high level. Not that those grow on trees or anything in the, in the transfer portal, but you know a guy that's proven he can do it. And all of a sudden, you you got a, a pretty solid roster for next year, and you've got a roster of guys with with some continuity to it going going into next year. Certainly more than they've had the first two years. All right, good good hoops right. discussion. That was good hoops discussion. Should we talk a little baseball and get out of here? Yeah, yes. yeah. So at three o'clock, you have a you have some work duties. I, I do have some work duties that three bells here, uh, two hours and 11 minutes away. Uh, at this point, Nebraska opens the season down in round rock, Texas, um, four games set against Purdue. Uh, as we all know, 44 game conference only season for the big 10 this year. Nebraska will play Purdue four times and they go up to Minneapolis next week and will not play Minnesota. They will play Ohio state and Iowa, uh, up in Minneapolis, but really a really, really interesting year, uh, in my eyes this team um big 10 put out its preseason coaches poll yesterday nebraska was not among the top six teams um the big 10 only puts out the top six teams for whatever reason um and nebraska was not a part of that i think a lot of that has to do with there's a lot of unknowns on that team especially around the league uh, just with all the roster moves i believe they brought in what are the numbers i believe they brought in 16 players brought in 17 players and 16 players left you know so half the roster essentially and you're going to see a lot of those guys play a lot um, early on. I think you're going to see a couple of freshman starters uh, in the infield. You're going to see uh, a lot of new arms. You look at the starting rotation and there's one guy in that starting rotation this weekend who's pitched as a starter for Nebraska before. And that is, that would be um, Cade Povich, the lefty uh, Bellevue West, uh, kind of the crafty guy, got a kind of a funky delivery. Um, and that's the only guy. And then you look at the other guys, Jake Buns, Elkhorn North was Juco last year. Shea Shannon came out of the bullpen last year for Nebraska and, and uh, Chance Roach was at um, New Mexico state last year. So it's, it's just really interesting to me. I think this team has the potential to be pretty good because I think they've upgraded athleticism pretty significantly uh, across the board. They've updated, they've upgraded depth pretty significantly in the infield, in the outfield at really every position, infield, outfield, pitching staff, catcher. And as I wrote for my, for my preview for the season, it's going to be a real balancing act. I think for Will Bolt to, you got to find the guys that can play and you've also got to be able to establish some rhythm too, and some continuity for guys. It's not a deal where you have midweek games and non-conference games to, to, you know, throw some guys out there and see what they can do. You got to kind of figure it out right off the bat. Cause you only get 44 and you may not play 44. We've seen what's happened with volleyball, basketball, football, you know, there's, there's a lot of precedent for saying Nebraska probably won't play 44 games uh, this spring. So you got to figure it out quick and you got to figure out what guys can do what and, and how effectively they can do it pretty quick. So it's, it's fascinating to me for a lot of different reasons. And yeah, I'll get started here in a couple hours. All right. Well, that's good. Good. To- good, good. So the, the top six, I know Michigan was one. Yeah. Um, let me, let me pull up the email. I think Indiana was two. Um, let's see. I would say Ohio state was three. I don't think I can get them all. Um, here I got, I got no, it right one here. One through six. Come on, simple. 
Michigan one, Indiana two, Ohio State three, Iowa four. People are high on Iowa this year. Uh, Maryland five, and Illinois six. Uh, Cade, Cade, you say Cade Povich is the Cade Povich. Yeah, he has a funky delivery. You have a funky delivery too, there, Baz. Wow, great, great. <laughs> that was a really smoothly delivered line, Sip. Good job. Your just your delivery was about a, just about missing a beat when he said that yeah, just, five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I had to build up to it. Just a real quick-witted, you know, sharp response. Sharp as attack. Sharp as attack. Certainly not a oh, battled right. man. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> I don't know if there's anything obvious we're missing. Uh, uh, there usually is. I mean, we're, we kind of half-ass this thing. Let's be honest. Volleyball no, back in not. action this weekend after uh, being yeah, postponed volleyball. last week. We got to get beat up on the podcast soon. If you had anything to talk about, his teams keep getting keep getting postponed. And, and yeah. that was a weird deal with the women's team last senior day last. Yeah, I got the women's basketball oh. team got their game called off an hour before tip, basically, and yeah. not for necessarily any positive tests on either side. Yeah, Michigan like State was in the build like they they literally made it to PBA and then found out that Minnesota had a positive test a couple of days before. They just bailed. They just left and went back to the airport. Said because because Minnesota this. had played Nebraska. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is that is one of the more odder circumstances I've heard during this whole COVID year. That yeah. Michigan State flew to Lincoln, tested at PBA that morning. Nebraska was warming up for the game, and Michigan State said, "Up, oh, we're out." Yeah, that, yeah. you know how you can kind of tell. You know how you can kind of tell based on statements and and just, you know just the way people say things. Like you could tell that. The Amy Williams and company was that that one stuck. No, yeah, I've noticed something about Amy. Her statements are you can tell when she's angry or yeah. doesn't agree with what happened. Yeah, they were hot about. I think they were hot about that. Well, and they had a right to be right. Like it's senior yeah. day. Yeah, you're honoring people that have been in that program a long time, and you think you're playing. Your your players are in uniform and they're warming up. And Michigan State says, "Oh, nope, sorry, can't do it." And even so, if, yeah. and, and even like, you know, even if that's falls in line with the medical, you know, guidelines and all of that, like, it's still just incredibly frustrating yeah. to come that place that close to playing a game and then having it pulled. Yeah. Back. Even in these out of ordinary times, that skews way out of ordinary. Like, yeah. like, I mean, just think of it from a cost perspective for Michigan State. They flew in. I mean, yeah, for nothing. Yeah, for nothing. Yeah. And, and you can make the argument, right? Like if you're Michigan State, you can make a, a compelling argument of like, well, yeah, no, we had every intention of playing. We flew all the way there. We paid the money to make the trip and all of that. Absolutely. It just wasn't, yeah. it just wasn't. And then Michigan State, you know, had, has had its own trouble recently at that. I think at that time they had multiple programs shut down already. And so, I mean, you can understand postseason coming up and all that, but man, that was a, that was a kind of a wild one on Sunday. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Crazy times we live, and we'll see what happens with baseball with that going forward, because I'm sure something bizarre is going to happen with that, too, at some point. So, all right, that was a good one, fellas. We'll wrap her up. I need to eat lunch. I need to get settled in for this baseball game. So, until next time, we'll talk to you guys next week.